mean, can you imagine W.C. Fields drinking Diet Yoo-Hoo? I mean, or eating granola. <laughs> ah, granola! <laughs> Uh, my, my favorite image, though, uh, would be W.C. Fields sitting down to a good breakfast of Fruit Loops. <laughs> would you please, Sam, if you will? <laughs> I mean, can you imagine drinking a drink that by itself is a diet drink, and now they've come out with a no-cal diet drink? It was a diet drink that is a double diet drink. All right, bring it up, please. We don't want to inflict this terrible stuff on people. By the way, many elements of tonight's show will have uh, certain aspects of totally bad taste, which, uh, of course, uh, reflects only real life as we know it in our time. It does not necessarily represent the views of the management, which is always an exquisitely good taste and always recommends good taste. And nor does it recommend, nor does it represent the, uh, uh, the attitudes of the speaker, who is always in favor of good taste, in spite of the fact that most of the life that we live is in bad taste. So uh, you'll just have to take your choice. Down the dial, they're playing Barbra Streisand. <laughs> That's good taste for you. You know, I've, I've always felt uh, uh, that uh, a really good working comic needs a foil. Uh, after all, uh, Jerry Lewis did lose something when Dean Martin went on, uh, you know, to become Dean Martin. He really did. He needs a foil. I mean, where would, for example, where would, uh, where would, uh, even Charlie Chaplin, where would Charlie Chaplin have been if it wasn't for that great big heavy set guy that wore that funny hat and had the black eyebrows who played the cop all the time? Nowhere. I mean, come on, then he'd do his little thing, you wouldn't laugh. It wasn't until the cop came out and decided to lay the arm on him that you laughed. Right. So every every good comic needs a foil. Now, in my case, my foil has always been the listener. <laughs> yeah, that's right. You're playing the dumb cop that keeps coming in and saying, What are you talking about, huh? Well, <laughs> if the shoe fits, buddy, put it on. <laughs> but uh, I mean that is you can tie the laces. But uh, the facts of the matter. <laughs> I mean you know you have to learn how to do that, dude. Can't, can't you remember when you were a kid and you actually learned how to tie your shoes? That's right. I mean that's that's one of life's little mileposts that you passed. Now not everybody passed it. <laughs> I don't know what you're laughing about. <laughs> Listen, I know some guys who never really learn how to tell time. They keep looking up at the clock, and, and you can see their lips moving. The big hand is like, <laughs> I mean, don't, don't be so funny. I hear you're laughing. But the, some of the most basic uh, tools that we use in our life, a lot of people never quite mastered them. I mean, if you notice a lot of guys' ties keep slipping down, they never learn how to tie a tie. Now, learning how to tie a tie, I remember as a kid, I can recall the fantastic sense of total achievement I had. You remember, right? I, I tied my tie, and it was actually tied. It really looked like a tie, instead of, you know, like a chunk of cloth with a knot in it. And that's a tremendous moment. Uh, and I, you know, I'm tying tie, you know. And then, I mean, what, what really bugged me was no sooner had I learned how to tie a tie, than wearing ties went out of style. I mean, I'm, don't laugh. It's it's a problem now today. As a matter of fact, very few guys wear ties much. You know, when when you have to wear a tie, when you've got going someplace, they say they specify a tie. Well, I've actually found myself saying, "Now, wait a minute. Now, let's see. <laughs> right? Well, let's see. Uh, 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 I mean, I'll tell you. I mean, uh, you you think you were? See how how shaky your knowledge is, buddy. <laughs> I mean, you think you could tie a tie in the dark? Well, you'd be surprised. You forget how to do it. Well, uh, uh, well, I'll tell you another great little moment of total total victory. I mean, learning how to tie a tie is one thing, but you're listening to a guy who really has a basic skill that sets me apart from the run of the hoi polloi lemming mankind, and I'm very proud of it.
What would you think that would be? I mean, I'm serious, secretly very proud of it. And I'll tell you, there isn't one man in ten that can do it. I'm talking about grown-up men. Nope. 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 And I'll tell you how I learned it. <laughs> I, mean, I learned it one hellish weekend. But uh, nevertheless, what I'd like to uh, I'd like to say this uh, in the in the standpoint from the standpoint of reality that. Uh, that I, I, I must say, though, that real life bears little relationship to anything in showbiz. Nothing. There is nothing in showbiz that's like real life. And, and the more television tries to get serious, the more it goes away from it. I don't know whether you saw this great three-hour thing on, on, on the violence, the TV. Everybody's looking very serious. But the funny part of it was, as, uh, as, Edwin Newman says, and America is a violent country, and he's going on talking about all this bad stuff. And they were interrupting it where I saw it, you know, when they do a station break, with promos for Kojak. And, 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 and yeah, at each one it shows Kojak saying something like, and I'll bring you in the head! Boom, boom, boom! And you saw a car going down over the cliff, blowing up, and then they would say, next week on NBC, and then they'd <laughs> So you see, unconscious humor uh, can be found everywhere, uh, and and it's it's found in in the most pompous moments, like uh, with the other night. I I uh, I heard this commentator come on scene, and you know the very serious type when uh, the newsman says, "And now here is Eric C. Bugleblast and tonight's commentary on the news," and they switch to another place. You know, and he's got this red curtain behind him, and he looks very serious. And he says things like, uh, well, tonight uh, it marks the 225th anniversary of the birth of the motor car. So they always talk slow, these guys. The uh, birth of the motor car. We in this corner say that the Americans love affair with the motor car, which is evil and smelly and kills 27 million people a year and is very, very uh, expensive. It's totally beyond me. And totally beyond a thinking person. And yet this is what our society is doing. And that is tonight's commentary on the news. Back to Walter. Well, I thought, I, I mean, I almost fell over. I can imagine this guy, because I know the guy. He goes to work every night in the longest, blackest Cadillac limousine you ever saw in your life. That baby gets maybe... Three, four miles to the gallon, downhill, with the key off. The next night, suggested that I take mass transit. Can you conceivably see Walter Cronkite coming to work on the subway? I just, just thought I'd throw that out there again. <laughs> or John Chancellor, or Barbara Walters, or any of them, for that matter. And yet they're always talking about the trouble with this country is that they don't want mass transit, and we should have mass transit. And there is, I can't imagine the professor, the head of the sociology department, coming to work on it. Okay. So unless it's Mercedes 220 transmission or something. <laughs> you know. They, <laughs> but, but so this is all the kind of stuff you know that, that, that you keep seeing when you watch television. Now, in the, in the name of reality, I mean, to, to, to bring reality right down into where it lives. I'm not, I'm not a reality one way or the other. But I'm fascinated with the difference between life and fantasy. That's what fascinates Can you imagine what would happen? By the way, speaking of fans, the worst picture I've seen this year. I have to give my award. The worst picture. What's the worst picture you've seen this year, Sam? And the year is young. Already, they've laid a bomb on me. Oh, absolutely. Right on the button. King Kong is the worst picture. In fact, I found that I was, I kept forgetting what picture I'm seeing while they were playing the titles. <laughs> what a bomb. What a bomberoonie. Uh, I, I, you know, there's an old slogan in art. You know what the slogan is? If you can't paint, do it big.
In other words, generally speaking, the bigger the picture, the worse the producer, director, the actor, the writer, the script writer, the, et cetera, down the line. In other words, the bigger the picture in almost every case, the bigger the bomb. It takes real talent to make a very small picture out of a low budget. That takes talent. I'll tell you. Oh, oh incidentally, speak. I, we've got to say this before we go any further. You know, the 1977 is just a brand new year. I mean, it's just starting out. And uh, already starting out with great promise to be the nuttiest year ever. We are starting our three, our, what is it, our third uh, century? Yeah, we're starting it with it. I mean, this is the year that is going to see evil Knievel leap over a tank of sharks. How's that for intellectual? <laughs> so, I mean, this, this is the kind of stuff I, I don't even think Caligula in ancient Rome would have, uh, you know, would have thought much by that. The next thing it has to, did you know that there's a guy that is now going to fight a white shark, you know, the great killer shark with karate? And, and, and another guy is going to fight a tiger with karate. And so the world <laughs> moves on as man becomes more civilized. But, uh, but oh, I, 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 we just got to bring these, uh, you know, th th bring them out into the open. But, you know, speaking of, uh, of reality, for example, I saw one night on, on the Waltons, they had this birthday party. Did you see that episode? Had this birthday party. Of course, everybody is so involved in birthdays. So these kids can have this birthday. So they make a whole big thing with the cake and everything. And, uh, and they sing the happy birthday song and they, they go through this whole thing and they give him his gift. And what do you think his gift is? It is the gift of love. Now, every kid would love to have that laid on him, wouldn't he? <laughs> <laughs> That's a writer's idea. No, a gift of love. And what they did was give him, yeah, they gave him this cake and they, they explained to him that it was a depression and nobody was working and what they're all going to give John John or whatever his name is, John Boy or little Cletus or whatever the kid's name was, they were going to give him a, the gift of love and they all got up and gave him a kiss. And you know what he said at the end of that? Mom, Mom, it's the best birthday that a kid ever had. Bum, ba -dum, bum. TV strikes again. Well, if you're if you're going to try that on your kid, give him a gift of love for his birthday. You better be prepared to have a fight on your hands. <laughs> I mean, but uh, nevertheless, this is the kind of stuff. See, and when I saw that, I saw that TV episode. I thought to myself, Oh God, oh wow. And so tonight, I've decided to do a salute to that little unrecognized American, and it's very American, that little unrecognized American yearly ritual that we all have. Would you please? Happy birthday to you. Yes, happy, happy birthday. birthday happy you. birthday to you. Happy birthday. Happy birthday. Happy birthday. Dear fellow happy Victor, birthday happy birthday to, to you. As happy you struggle your way to through you. life, happy as the unkind winds you. buffet you from one table to happy the next, birthday. as you struggle happy through birthday. the alimony payments, happy, happy birthday to you. As the cold sores come, <laughs> all right, we're going to have a party. All right. <laughs> Happy birthday. Now, I'm not a curmudgeon. I'm really not, you know. I, no, I'm not. No, no. I dig birthday parties. Oh, no, no. The one thing about me, I am not a curmudgeon. And you know what a curmudgeon is. That's a 19th century word meaning sore head. I mean, well, Scrooge was a curmudgeon. I mean, a curmudgeon is always saying, bah, humbug. Well, I don't say that. I dig birthdays. It's just that they can be very painful. I mean, and embarrassing. Not because you're another year older, but because you don't quite know what to do on a birthday. And at, at, at one of the most embarrassing things I ever had in my life one time, 
Do you know that I did a happy birthday program on television? Yeah. Yeah, what we had was a five-minute TV show. And the program director, this was out in the Midwest, the program director, I had this comedy show. Number right, you know? Program director came to me and he says, listen, he said, will you do me a favor? I said, what is the favor that you want? I mean, I'm always suspected, really deeply suspicious of favors that program directors ask you. And he says, well, I'll tell you what the story is. You know that gift shop down in the corner of 4th and Wolf? La Petite Gifty Shoppy. I says, yeah, I know the La Petite Gifty Shoppy. They got those little cute rabbits in the window all the time. They're playing violins and the little, uh, little bears that are sitting down there drinking beer and stuff like that. He says, yeah, that's the place, Kitchell place. I says, what's the favor? He says, well, the guy that owns that absolutely loves you. And what he wants to do is on a birthday television show where every day we salute a kid who's having a birthday in the audience. I said, what? He says, yeah. They want to salute a kid that's having a birthday. I said, well, how do I do that? He said, well, you have this theme. Do you want to hear it? Play it again. That was the theme. The theme came on like this, and they're looking dumb. Happy birthday to you. Happy oh. birthday I said, hello, you. gang. Oh, birthday, birthday people everywhere. Birthday, hello, birthday, birthday fans everywhere. Today, we have a real special birthday to celebrate. Happy birthday it's the birthday of little Marsha Bugleblast, who is eight birthday. years old today. Happy, happy birthday, birthday Marsha. Now, let's all sing to Marsha. Let's We're sing it all up. We're going to have a party, a party, a party. Oh, wow. I'll tell you, when I get up before the Bar of Justice and St. Peter looks down, he is going to ask me about that show. It's been entered in the big book on the red ink side. <laughs> well, I'll tell you though. I do have one thing I must say. When I when I when I saw that kid getting the gift of love. Do you know what a real gift of love is? When somebody sits down and he's gonna give a present to somebody else and he really thinks about it. Now that's not the same as running around a lot going to a lot of stores he really thinks about it he says if I was Sam what would I love to get and you know what that takes you have to erase yourself and you have to think through that other person's head now, a lot of people are too self-involved to do that it's not easy well, I will never forget. In fact, out of all the gifts that I remember getting, now all of you have gotten gifts all of your life. I mean, from the time you were a little kid, you've gotten gifts, Christmas uh, uh, gifts, birthdays, and so on. I expect that if you're 30 years old, let's just take that young age, 30, you've probably gotten a couple of good gifts in your time. How many of them actually, without sitting there and really deliberately thinking, really racking your head, how many of them can you actually remember? Maybe three or four at the most. And those were gifts that somebody really thought about. They really laid one right down the middle of the alley. Pow. Well, I remember a gift I got that absolutely, I'll tell you, it blew my beezer. Now, the hardest thing to give is a gift to a kid. Why? Because, for one thing, kids are more open. That doesn't mean they're more honest than people, because kids are people. Uh, <laughs> kids are more are more open. In other words, he hasn't learned yet to control the look of disappointment. <laughs> I mean, we all have learned that 
I mean, that's the thing you learn pretty early in life. And so by the time you're, say, 17 or 18, you've already got that under control. But when you give a kid of eight or nine a gift, I mean, the look of disappointment, like, uh uh-huh. Like, yeah, I really like them bunny slippers. Yeah, yeah, they're really cute. Mm. You know, the kid... The kid is not, it's not so much that he's honest. It's, he's very open. He's, he's, uh, everything there is there. Well, I was, uh, I'll t- I, I remember what birthday it was. I was nine. Now, uh, what, what, what would a boy of nine, a boy of nine. Now, the most obvious thing is get him a bike, right? Well, a boy of nine at that point, they usually had a lot of bikes. You have a tricycle, you get a bike, you know. It would be great to get a nice new bike. Okay, fine. But that doesn't show any ingenuity. It does not fill a, a, a secret gap. That's the, that's the trick of a gift. A secret gap. A gap that often the kid himself didn't know he had. Now that, that, that's sneaky. And I was nine, okay? How I remember I was nine is, is because of what's what the gift was. Now, my mother, you know, and my kid brother, we had this. I was nine. Okay, my kid brother, he was about seven. See, so uh, we're going to have this birthday, <laughs> and, and and a couple of kids came over. You know, they had the birthday thing in the afternoon and all that stuff, and I, you know, the usual thing, and and the card came and little things with bunnies on it and all that stuff. And, and I, now I would not have remembered my ninth birthday because most people can't remember. Can you remember specific birthdays? Can you remember your eighth birthday or your seventh or your twelfth even? Or, no, that's right. You can't even hardly remember your last birthday. But to re, there's just a generic thing that you have in your head, just the universal birthday. You know, you don't, you don't think in terms of remembering one specific. I remember my ninth and I'll tell you why I remember my ninth. The night of my birthday. Now I had whatever gifts I got. I don't even remember any of the other gifts. None of them. As far as I was concerned, my birthday is already over now. See, it's after supper. I have my gifts and everything else, and it's kind of cooling off, and I'm no longer the birthday boy, you know. Uh, and uh, we had the uh, birthday cake and all that stuff. And now it's in the evening when the phone rang. See, my mother goes in the front, and she answers, and she picks up the phone, and she's talking to my Aunt Glenn. Well, my Aunt Glenn, uh, who was, was, a, was an aunt that hardly ever came over. You know, she was just a, one of those distant aunts that you once in a while run into. See, my mother says, well, you know, it's, it's little Jeannie's birthday, and we're staying home tonight. Well, no, no, no you can come over. No, we, we've had the party. No, it's okay. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And in other words, my Aunt Glenn didn't even know it was my birthday. See, <laughs> they didn't know it. So anyway, they're coming over. So I, I didn't think anything about it. So I go down to the basement. I'm fooling around. I come back up. And about an hour later, the doorbell rings. And in comes my Aunt Glenn and my Uncle Tom. Well, they come in. And my Aunt Glenn had this gift, right? And a, a typical aunt gift, which I immediately forgot. <laughs> I don't remember the gift at all. It was just. My aunt Glenn had a gift. Well, we're, we're sitting around and, and uh, I'm talking to my aunt, tell her about all the gifts I got for my birthday. You know, my, uh, aunts always say, what did you get for your birthday? And you take this stuff out and you show them. And I go in the kitchen and I'm fooling around. I come back out. And all of a sudden, my Uncle Tom's to say, he said, uh, my Uncle Tom, I hardly, I can't even uh, remember much about him. He was just one of those uncles that disappear out of your life early. But I'll always remember this. Uncle Tom, I come back into the living room, and he said, uh, hey, he said, uh, come over here. He said, uh, it's your birthday. And I said, yeah. He says, well, got your gift. He says, yeah. And he reaches into his pocket. Now, the most cop-out gift of all is to give a kid money. I mean, it's great to get it, but you don't remember it. It's just money. I figured, you know, he's going to give me a dollar or something. No. Uncle Tom reaches in his pocket and he takes out of his back pocket, his back pocket, 
the greatest gift that I ever got in a whole string of birthday gifts. And he says, this is for you. This is for you. And he laid it on me. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Yes. Happy birthday. Fantastic. Good Lord. There I had in my hand something that a nine-year-old boy goes bananas over. Only I didn't, I, I never thought of it. I never thought of asking. So this is a gift. It was my first wallet. Now, if you're so old, that you don't see how exciting it is for a nine-year-old boy to get a wallet. You are really getting old. You're getting old where it counts in your head. Because if there's anything that sets men apart from boys when you're a little kid is men carry wallets. My dad was always taking this wallet out and looking through it. He had all these papers and he had all these little glass envelopes that had stuff like licenses in it. I mean, that is a symbol. And even today, most men, I'm serious, most men, the, the, the unconscious thing that's always in their mind is checking their wallet. The great guys often will walk out of a shower without any pants on. But that wallet... You check the wallet because the wallet contains your life. And if you don't have a wallet, somehow you're really naked. You really are naked. As a matter of fact, you know, this is part of police psychology. One of the ways they really get a guy so that he's ready almost to confess is to take away his wallet. I mean, it's like they simply said, look, we're taking all of it away. We're taking not the money. The money's nothing. It's all the rest. It's the wallet. And it was a leather wallet. And Uncle Tom said, here, let me show you how it works. He says, now, see, look. He says, now, here's where you put your important papers. And it had one of these slide things, you know, with all the glassine envelopes. He said, you can put all your papers in there. He said, now, here, over here on the other side... It's got this little thing with the clip on it, this little snap. It's got this little, you can put your change in it. And here's for your big bills. Big bills. And he opened it up, and inside of it was nine $1 bills. Nine. I'll tell you, that night, I, I was out of my, I was out of my skull. And I went into my room and I put my important papers in my wallet. Like, for example, all right, you want to know what they were, all right? All right. We had a bus pass for school. <laughs> you know the pass, the bus that you have to have? I had a, a thing like, uh, I had a uh, combination lock, which had a, a you know, a combination. So... It had a little card. It says the cop. I put that in the back and the secret. So if anybody, you know, stole my wallet, they would never know how to open my combination lock. And uh, I put, <laughs> I put all this great stuff, you know. And, and I, yeah, and and, and that it, it was bulgy. See, and I stuck him. Oh wait, I haven't told you the best part of it. The front of it had a picture on it, burnt in the leather, of Roy A. Cuff. Now, that's a wallet. I mean, it was a big leather, fat one. It wasn't a plastic. It was a man's wallet. Now, remember, it's a real wallet. My kid brother went, he went out of it. He was, he was so buff that my kid brother threw a tantrum that lasted for eight, nine months just because I had this wallet. And I'll never forget the first afternoon taking it out casually, you know. I had a I had a calendar in it, you know, one of these things you get free from the bank. I took it out, I took it out, and I said, uh, Schwartz, I'll look and see what uh, next Wednesday, what? That's the 12th. Schwartz turned blue. 